and my PhD is going to be on the eco-evolutionary dynamics and the evolution of phenotypic plasticity. As this is more of a broad topic, I'm going to give you a bit of a general introduction about the study questions that I'm interested in before I dive into the details of my chapters. So there's a whole variation in nature. This variation can be interspecific as well as intraspecific. And what are the evolutionary forces that drive variation in nature among species and across organisms? It's the interplay of the environment and the underlying genetic mechanisms. So, for instance, if there is variability in the environments and there is a genotype or a gene that is environmentally sensitive, it gives rise to various phenotypes and this in turn eventually can be a strong evolutionary force driving either intraspecific variation or phenotypic plasticity or given the sufficient amount of genetic variation and reproductive isolation, even adaptive divergence or speciation. And to be able to answer those questions, I am going to incorporate an array of um, organisms and study questions into my dissertation. So my first chapter is going to be on the dwarfism of the netojectodes in Doniana and my, for my second and to my fourth chapter I'm going to study the evolution of phenotypic plasticity in the spade food toad Pelobates cultripes and what are its consequent effects. And my last chapter is going to be on the phenotypic plasticity of the water flea Daphnia magna. So my first chapter is on the approximate causes of dwarfism in close continental dwarf populations in the netherjack toad Bufo calamita. And so there's intraspecific variation across animal taxa, right? And what are the factors that drive intraspecific size variation? It, those are the abiotic factors such as temperature, photo period, altitude and latitude, <coughs> with the interaction of selective forces such as competition or predator-prey interaction that give rise to intraspecific size variation. And what is interesting in the system of the netherjack toad here in southern Spain is that usually in island systems where there is an efficient geographical barrier, intraspecific size variation can be observed within short distances, whereas in most continental systems you have to travel great distances to be able to observe a sharp climb in intraspecific specific size variation, whereas in southern Spain uh, with the first reported study on small, small marbled newt of Diaz Paniagua et al., you can see a sharp decline in intraspecific, intraspecific size variation within a very short distance. And we are interested in what ecological factors drive this phenomenon and to what extent there is gene flow present across those, those populations. Um, so, as I said before, there is a sharp decline of size in the populations of Doniana and the Sierra Norte of Sevilla in the netherjack toad in the absence of an efficient geographic barrier and you can observe a difference in the body length of up to 30 percent. And in, in, order to, in order to fully understand the, uh, under, uh, the diverse array, array of the ecological factors that drive this phenomenon, I am employing standard metabolic rate analysis, skeleton stable isotope analysis, skeletal chronology, male advertisement costs and female behavior assays as well as population genetics. And I have two dwarf populations, two intermediate populations and two populations of the Sierra Norte of Sevilla. So the standard metabolic rate <coughs> test is, is set up in the laboratory overnight and all the animals are put in a terrestrial respirometer each and <coughs> For each hour during the whole night, I take the average point of the volume of oxygen consumption where the animal was resting most constantly to be able to get the most standard um, value of the volume of oxygen consumption. And in the end, I'm getting one average value for all the animals of the volume of oxygen consumption rate. And I did an ANCOVA test on this with body mass as covariate. And it seems that there is a decline with lower, with lower metabolic rate in Doniana and higher metabolic rate in the Sierra Norte. And I do get significant results for this analysis. And another thing is that I did stable isotope analysis to track the different sources of carbon and nitrogen in the footage of those populations. 
and the analysis was conducted on hatchlings right after they hatched from their clutches and right before they started free feeding to be able to directly assess the diet of the female that provided the yolk. And for nitrogen as well as for carbon, I did an ANOVA analysis and I do get significant results and it seems that there is a decline for all those populations and for carbon as well. And this is, this is quite interesting as, as it seems that there is a decline in the food source of those populations. And then I'm doing, I did a skeletal chronology, chronology analysis and this is still ongoing work to look at the age structure across the populations and to be able to assess whether the small individuals in Dunyana actually do mature young. <laughs> and then I did a description of the male advertisement calls. So the dominant frequency of, of males is an honest signal and small males do call with higher, no lower dominant frequency and larger males with, what am I saying? So yeah, the, the smaller males call with higher dominant frequency and this is an honest signal that they cannot fake and there is a client of course that the dominant frequency of the Doñana populations is higher than the dominant frequency of the populations in the Sierra Norte and we are also interested in whether the large females of the northern populations do discriminate against the small males in Doñana. So we did a female <laughs> behavioral essay on this and we have the data in hand. And in addition to all those ecological factors that we are testing until now, we are also interested in to what extent there is gene flow across those populations. And to analyze this, we are incorporating neutral markers, microsatellites, which are stretches of DNA of one to six base pairs that are relatively small in size, highly polymorphic, and due to their multi-allelic nature, co-dominant inheritance, and because they are easily amplified in the lab using PCRs, they are widely used for population genetic study purposes. And um, so with this in hand, we are going to be able to assess what are the factors that drive the intraspecific size variation in Bufo Calavita. Then going on to my second chapter, which is on the population divergence of the developmental plasticity in the spade food toad Pelobates cultripes. And what is phenotypic plasticity? So phenotypic plasticity is the ability of an organism to give rise to various types of morphology or physiology or behavior in the uh, variation of environment, in the presence of predators or because of diet or annual rainfall. But these are animals, this is, this is the ability of a gene to respond to the environment to give rise to various phenotypes. And um, given that there is enough environmental variability, plasticity stays either decreased or increased, but no matter whether the amount of plasticity is increased or decreased, decreased animals get genetically accommodated. And there is also an e extreme version of genetic accommodation, which is genetic assimilation in case the environment, environmental variability decreases and selection removes the formerly environmentally induced phenotypic trait then the plasticity will decrease and the animal will go through canalization. In order to be able to answer such questions, we have the system of the spade food toads. And due to analytical reconstruction, we can assess that the ancestral state of this species group was a species that was more closer to Pelobates cultripes with higher pheno phenotypic plasticity. Given pond desiccation, given low water, they are able to decrease their larval period by a lot and accelerate development, whereas Bea multiplicata has intermediate level of phenotypic plasticity and Scaphiopus cauchy has almost lost its ability to accelerate development. And this results in, in changes of the morphometrical allometry upon metamorphosis. So the Scaphiopus cauchy, for example, has shorter hind limbs and blunter snouts and the Pelobates cultripes higher, longer hind limbs and higher snouts associated to the larval period. So we can see here that all these species are at least to some degree all genetically accommodated. And we are interested in assessing how did the process of genetic accommodation start. So in order to be able to 
answer such questions, we will assess the degree of population adaptive divergence in Pelobates cultripes, which is a species that retains most of its ancestral state of phenotypic plasticity. And we are looking into populations that originate from <coughs> either ephemeral breeding sites or long lasting ponds. So I have for this study three long lasting and three short lasting populations of Madrid and two long lasting and two short lasting populations of the Doñana area. And I am raising them all in high water until at Gosner stage 35, which is a developmental stage of the amphibians when they already have their height limb out and we, you can see the digits differentiated. I decrease the water level of health of the treatment and at, upon metamorphosis, I take data on their larval period, weight and, and their morphometry. And also, of course, developmental acceleration comes at a cost. This is achieved by high corticosterone level, increased thyroid hormone level, and increased thyroid hormone receptor level. And I expect that in long-lasting ponds, within the individuals that, are, that were subject to accelerate their development, that experience environmental stresses, there will be higher level of corticosterone level, and they will also have experienced higher oxidative stress, whereas in the short-lasting ponds, the level of corticosterone will be constitutively high as they will have evolved a mechanism to accelerate development <coughs> and will have subsequently experienced lower oxidative stress. And I am also going to do RNA sequence analysis. So in phenotypic plasticity studies, and a transcriptomic approach is very good to determine the extent of environmentally induced changes in the gene expression because the RNA is highly dynamic and it varies at a given time. And the way it's done, well, this is a very basic schematic view, but if you have a sample of interest, for example, tadpoles that originate from low and high water in this case, you extract the RNA and then the I RNA that you want has to be isolated because the RNA body is huge and then it's sequenced using either next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing. And I'm also going to do population genetics. The first thing I'm going to do is single nuclear type polymorphism, so SNPs are automatically recognized during the transcriptomic analysis, right? And this is a position in a genome where, once, where some individuals have one nucleotide and others a different one, and it's used widely to determine the genetic differentiation across populations or organisms. And then I'm going to do microsatellites to determine the presence of gene flow across populations. And this is important because it shows that um, the observed pattern is not due to biogeographic effects that are unrelated to the adaptation to pond hydro period. I do have some preliminary results for the larval period and it seems that there are some populations that do not exactly behave as predicted but for this reason I am, I am currently repeating the experiment on four clutches uh, to be able to assess the um, larval period when development is accelerated and as for body mass and for body length, it seems that the, both the body mass and body length are significantly decreased when animals go through the water drop experiment and are forced to accelerate the de development. So now I'm going on to my third chapter, which is on the carryover effects of the lava environment <coughs> to environmental challenges in the terrestrial phase in the spade food toad Pelobates cultripes. And for this experiment, I have currently 300 toads. And each of the um, toads that originate from either high water control or low water are now split into dry and humid treatments. The dr dry treatment is split into 17 milliliters of water during the dry season and currently in the winter because I'm simulating the <coughs> rainy season of the winter, I'm adding 35 milliliters of water to the dry treatment. And then the humid treatment receives constantly 152 milliliters of water. So I expect reduced growth and survival in toads that suffered either water drop in the aquatic phase and or desiccation in the terrestrial phase. So I'm expecting that the um, toads that originate from high water in the larval period and are now currently in the humid conditions during the terrestrial phase will grow better, better for instance, than any other conditions that experience some kind of environmental stress and definitely better that went through pond desiccation as well as desiccation during the terrestrial phase. 
And my fourth chapter is going to be on the transgenerational effects of the environmental stresses that were experienced in the parental generation in the spade food told Pelobatus cultripes. So I'm going to raise the toast to sexual maturation to explore the parental effects on the development of F1. And I'm going to have the four combinations that I also had for ch chapter three, but this time I can also split everything into maternal and paternal effects. So for example, if I have a male that originates from the high water treatment and humid land treatment, and if I made this male with a female that originates from low water and dry land and a female that originates from low water and humid land, it is going to be possible to tease apart the effects of, of the paternal and maternal effects. So the aims of this chapter would be to assess the transgenerational effects of the capacity to respond to environmental challenges and also to tease apart the paternal and maternal effects. The paternal effects are going to be genetic or epigenetic whereas the maternal effects are going to be genetic, hormonal, or nutritional. And my fifth chapter, since um, it is taking a lot of time in the laboratory to raise the amphibians until we can assess questions on phenotypic plasticity across generations and across populations, I am going to do this project on Daphnia, which is going to be on the population dynamics that are resulted <coughs> due to their phenotypically plastic responses. And I'm going to have two populations with five clones of each that has a strong phenotypic plasticity and two treatments, one treatment with and one treatment without predator cues and five replicates each. And I predict that the treatment that received a predator <coughs> cue is going to develop a lot faster and is going to produce more eggs which is obviously going to completely change the population demography. And based on this, I'm going to build a model to describe the weight of the phenotypic alterations on population demography. Um, so I'm currently in my first year and still have a long way to go. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, my group, and special thanks go to the lab technicians in my department, Raquel and Miguel Angel, although I, didn't, I couldn't find a photo of him. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.